Hi, everybody. I'm Elaine Ubina, co-founder of Fairfield County Look with my husband, Chi Chi. Thank you for attending our Philanthropy Look Zoom today. We're thrilled to have you here. Having photographed and documented charity events for over 30 years in New York, Connecticut, Westchester, and Palm Beach, Florida, we've experienced the heyday of the late 1980s to the dips of 9-11 and 2008. We're here to support our partner nonprofits and thank them for their years of loyalty to us. Though it's not an easy time, it's a time of reflection, opportunity, and reinvention in fundraising. It's a chance for collaboration as well. We are thrilled to have these three thought leaders with us. We've seen these women grow and flourish in their fields. First of all, I would like to introduce Dimitra Ganias, our moderator for our talk. She is the founder of Ganias Media Lab. Dimitra spent her career in television newsrooms, mastering the art of dynamic and powerful storytelling. She is a public speaking expert and consultant. We are happy to have Demetra on the Look team, heading up our new Look video division. It's an innovative dimension in storytelling for our clients, and you'll hear more about that in the days to come. Uh, Demetra, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Elaine. Such a warm welcome, and welcome to our distinguished guests. We are so proud that you are sharing your expertise today, because we all need it. Noelle Appel, Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer at Greenwich Hospital. Mary Lee Kiernan, President and CEO of the YWCA of Greenwich. Jill Coyle, who serves on numerous boards. She is very active with the University of Notre Dame, serving on the Experience Advisory Board and Women's Initiative Steering Committee. She is the Vice Chair of the American Red Cross Board in New York City and locally serves on the board of the American Red Cross in Greater New York. She is also on the board of the Breast Cancer Alliance. We are so honored that you're with us today sharing your expertise. And we're so grateful to all of you joining us as part of the webinar. We look forward, of course, to your participation. So please do give any questions that you have in the chat box. We will do our best to answer them all and get through them as quickly as possible. And our mission today is to brainstorm it is to problem solve, and it's to join forces so that each participant today can continue to do good in each of your respective organizations. So let's dive right in. Noelle, Mary Lee, and Jill, I'm going to start by asking each of you to talk about this abrupt switch to virtual communication. We know that human interaction is such a huge component of philanthropy. So how are you fostering meaningful connections with members and donors in this challenging time? Noelle? Thank you, and thanks for having us, having me with you today. It's really exciting to be part of this wonderful group and this conversation. Um, I think we found ourselves in a, in a moment um, that started to, to define itself in many ways for us. Uh, the particular experience of the hospital, there was such an enormous sense of urgency to support people at, on the front line, um, physically in the hospital. <clears throat> we had gone completely off-site as an entire unit, and we did it quickly and we did it early. Um, I think we were getting a sense of connectivity, though, to our colleagues at the hospital with constant feed on what they needed and what their challenges were. And at the same time, the community was actually leaning in very quickly and swiftly toward us. Um, and it, it was really a change dynamic in many ways. And we started to redefine really within the first couple of days, frankly, um, how we were being responsive in return. Uh, I think central to all of that was listening on both sides of this equation to the needs of our colleagues at the hospital and bridging that to the incredible outpouring from our community. I mean, some of the statistics on things that people wanted to do for us, both from philanthropy to meals and PPE, were just really extraordinary. Um, and I, I, the other thing that we spent a lot of time doing was thinking about our story and telling that story to our community. Uh, so we mobilized very quickly to start with communicating through, actually through email, frankly, first. Um, but there were so many phone calls and so much personal outreach from individual members of the team to just see how people were doing in the community. 
And we did that very steadily from the beginning. We're still doing it, actually. Excellent. Thank you, Mary Lee. Or similarly, we went remote uh, in accordance with the governor's order in, in mid-March, but you know, we're the accredited provider of domestic violence services here in Greenwich, which is unfortunately the number one violent crime here. And those services continue, you know, whether it's a holiday or a weather event, they go remote uh, on and off uh, all, all of the time. So that was not a hard pivot, but everything else was a, a, a more difficult pivot. So we created a, a virtual YWCA. Uh, we transformed our website and it became the main platform for services, information, ideas, connectivity to our members and to the public. And then of course we were on Instagram Live, on Zoom, on Facebook Live, on email, uh, making phone calls to every single member, to our key donors. It was really a time to reimagine how we can have those relationships in a sort of a warm, authentic way, but by different means, you know, digitally and of course um, over the phone and by email. Excellent, thank you. And Jill. Yeah, thank you, Demetra. Happy to be here. Um, I, you know, it's interesting when the lockdown sort of first happened in the in mid March. I think everyone was scrambling a little bit and also trying to appreciate the balance of not um, not looking like they're still desperately trying to fundraise in this global health during this global health crisis and trying to be sensitive to that. So. Um, and as Elaine well knows, the spring is such a busy time for events. So at the same time, you know, all these events on the calendar and everything's been shut down and people are scrambling to figure out sort of what the right thing to do is, whether it's, uh, whether it's even seen as appropriate to still be fundraising in the middle of this crisis. Um, and then of course, for the Red Cross, you know, they were absolutely on the front lines of this whole situation and collecting the convalescent plasma and all of the blood drives across the country were shut down and the nation still needs blood. Um, so it, it was a real crisis for a lot of the organizations that I'm involved in, but you know, I'm proud to say they really sort of retooled in the case of the Red Cross. Um, there was a national campaign to obviously get people, you know, feeling comfortable going back to blood drives and that sort of thing. And that really worked out well. Um, locally, we normally do, uh, in New York, we have this every year, this, and I've chaired the last few years, this women's leadership lunch and in the city, which I've 200 women. So obviously that couldn't happen, but, um, we decided to retool that as, or reimagine that as a virtual event and um, a virtual event that we created as a conversation series. So we had the, f the first of which we had was in June. Normally this event is a May event. So we had this in June with the intention of having more of these throughout the year with sort of inform, it was a 45 minute, actually it went over a little bit to an hour event um, with, we happen to have celebrities. We had Sharon Stone and we had the CEO of the American Red Cross, which, you know, I think people, a, a lot of people tuned into it because it was relevant, a relevant topic that people really wanted to hear what the Red Cross response was. Um, and then the Breast Cancer Alliance also did an amazing job with, you know, their Walk for Hope was reimagined as a day long virtual event. And I know Elaine was involved in that. Um, a day long virtual event uh, with you know fitness for you know fitness for hope and multiple different virtual events and people doing all sorts of exercising online uh, so that you know I think um, and of course there it, it continues right so breast cancer alliance uh, annual benefit luncheon which has over a thousand women coming up this October also won't be able to happen in person, obviously. Um, so we're working on sort of retooling that and there are some awesome creative ideas going on um, as far as reimagining that, which I'm happy to talk about if you'd like. But, um, you know, so people are, people are working with it and I think everyone at this point, as far as donors and 
our audience. Um, people are used to this new format, right? And are sort of hungry for information. And so I, I feel like it's working. Well, Jill, since you touched on events, I'm going to skip down to that. I know that a lot of what entices a community to come out for a nonprofit is the fun. That is the fun in fundraising. And of course, that opportunity has been taken away. So when we talk about these virtual events, you know, what are some of these rules to executing a stellar virtual event? Is it the specific platform, the timeline? Uh, and then, of course, Mary Lee will hear about the Old Bags Lunch, and you did that virtually. Jill, did you want to add? Sure. I mean, so this, the, our reimagined women's leadership lunch or, that we did for the Red Cross, um, we've in the past had celebrities participate, and it's typically been somebody from the Red Cross sort of providing information on the current sort of execution of the mission of the Red Cross. And then additionally, we have some sort of celebrity having a conversation about what it means to be you know, what philanthropy means to them and giving back means to them. And so you know, last year, for example, we had Savannah Guthrie and we had Ashley Banfield interviewing her and it was fantastic. Um, so when we were scrambling to figure out what to do with um, our new imagined event this year, we had, um, we had Sharon Stone, who as it turns out was awarded the uh, gold medal by the Italian Red Cross a couple of years ago for some work that she did with them. So that was sort of a nice tie-in. And since the when the pandemic started, she was very um, sort of supportive of the Red Cross and promoting it and particularly with everything going on in Italy. So that was a really nice tie-in. But I will say, yes, lessons learned from that. And, and um, we're keeping some of those lessons in mind as we start to plan for the, uh, the BCA event but it, this October. But I think... It, it needs to be tight timing. I don't think it can go past an hour, otherwise you lose people's attention. Um, and I think you can't prep enough with the tech. There are so many platforms, obviously Zoom, you know, Zoom, um, what is it, Zoom webinar, Zoom professional allows you to have, I think, up to 5,000 people. So that worked out well for us for the Red Cross because we had people internationally, both posts. Uh, the only problem is often if you use a tech company or a production company that loads the Zoom platform onto their platform or loads Zoom onto their platform. So it's, it's getting a little technical, but so that it's easier for people to just join by a URL link. Um, you really have to do your due diligence on the tech company. And the Red Cross hired this very reputable production company who I won't name, but um, it was not great, the tech. And we had, when I watched the, I didn't know during the time as I was speaking, but it, it looked to me like the, the mouth and the sound were at different times. And so when I watched the re-recording of it, you know, that's, that was what the audience saw as well. And here we had this amazing content, amazing participants, um, you know, certainly Sharon Stone, who was on it, has her own production studio in her home. <laughs> it was not her tech that was causing it. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think that's really a, a certainly a lesson learned. And then I think, you know, just making sure that making sure you're not trying to tackle too much with your, you know, with your event and too many speakers or too much content, you really want to sort of grab their attention, I guess. Thank you. Well, it's the honest feedback that's going to make a difference for the next time. So we do appreciate that. Mary Lee, talk to us about the Old Bags Luncheon and how you were able to pivot. Sure. So the Old Bags Luncheon um, is a signature, one of the signature events here at the YWCA. We really have four fundraising events each year in addition to our annual appeal work. And this is usually a luncheon of 300 uh, 40 or 50 at the Bell Haven, beautiful Bell Haven Club, uh, that is uh, dedicated to funding for services for victims of domestic violence, as I mentioned. Uh, and so that each year we pair that with uh, a live and silent auction of handbags, um, some new, some gently used that are donated from all over the community. They just appear here at the YW every year and it's, it's wonderful. Uh, that everyone digs deep every year to to make that happen. Um, and so how do you do that virtually? How do you create the excitement 
around those auctions, which everyone looks forward to, as well as provide the quite serious content we do provide at this event. We always have a victim who speaks uh, and shares her uh, compelling uh, story. And so we wanted to maintain that balance. Meech, as you mentioned, the, the fun and fundraising is certainly an, an attraction, but you know, you can't be tone deaf right now to uh, the difficulties and the hardships that so many uh, are going through, whether it's uh, health related or economic. Uh, so we, we struck a balance, I think, between uh, maintaining some of the the attraction of that event, uh, gathering together uh, for a good cause, obtaining some new handbags, but also providing really compelling content. And so we had a, a conversation among several of our board members and staff uh, from our uh, domestic abuse services division. And uh, it was really uh, an important educational conversation. Obviously, we referred to Jennifer Dulos and uh, her situation, which, but for COVID, was really the biggest story impacting uh, our world in domestic violence uh, this year. And we use a platform called Give Smart, and that is a bidding platform, but it also enables you to uh, post videos and content. Um, and so we actually elongated the timeline instead of shortening the timeline. And so we had bidding available on Give Smart for a couple of days before uh, what we sort of called the live event when this video content was available. Um, and we kept the bidding open for a couple of more days and, and it closed on a Saturday night at midnight. And there were a lot of people, you know, using that Saturday night as their entertainment and, and you know, participating in the bidding, watching the important content. And uh, we ended up being uh, more successful than we ever imagined we would be. We had 20% more people participating than normally show up at the live event. Um, we more than exceeded our, our budget goal, which in, in this period of time was, again, uh, really uh, th thrilling for us to, to achieve that for the services and the victims we, uh, we provide. And so it was just a format that lent itself to, um, to both entertainment and participation and um, learning about uh, our services. Excellent. I'm sure it felt wonderful to meet that goal and, of course, so gracious of everyone to participate. Uh, Noelle, if you could tell me a little bit about how much you depend on events like this, or if there are other strategies that you find most successful. You have been incredibly successful in fundraising for the hospital. What do you think are the hallmarks of your strategy that really work and that others can perhaps mimic? Well, thank you for that question. I certainly just learned a great deal from my two colleagues on this um, about the events that they have been doing virtually. I will, I want to start by just saying that we, we actually couldn't do any events during this timeline. Um, what we could do was study the field, support the hospital. There were just an urgency and actually a quieting down quite significantly of our, even our access to the most senior leaders for things that had we gone public with some kind of a gathering, uh, we would have needed them and as well as our trustees. And that was fine. We, we, we worked on other things. But um, I, you know, the question about success, I, I, think, um, I think the events for Greenwich Hospital have been this a glorious moment of joining in gratitude and in um, community with the people in, in the town of Greenwich and beyond. Um, there has just been such an outpouring over so many years in support of the hospital. We talk about it all the time. We are grateful for it all the time. And I think the events through the years have really celebrated all of that. Um, while giving the community, um, you know, to, to Mary Lee's point and, and Jill's to a certain extent as well, insight into what the hospital is doing and what the future looks like. So. As we are looking toward the calendar for the upcoming year, and we work on a fiscal year, so it's going to start grandly on October 1st, um, 
we really see a sequence of educational opportunities virtually for our community. You know, most of you may know by now that Norman Roth, our CEO of over six years, has, has retired and that announcement just came out at the end of June. Diane Kelly is president now and, and Norman's last days will be on October 2nd. So we actually have something planned on September 10th. We're calling it a fireside chat. And, but again, the, the purpose of it is to really engage our friends and tell our story and the story of what is happening at the hospital because there seems to be a hunger to understand also the science and the medicine of this pandemic as well. So, you know, there's a couple of different ways we can engage in that, in that area. We actually are hoping for a sequence of those next year. And the big decision now that we're circling around and are planning is how do we take that very special event that's come to be known so well to so many of our friends and to us, which is, you know, our benefit, and, and decide whether or not that too needs to go virtual, even as late as May of 2021. And it may seem like that's crazy, but when you look at parameters and guidelines and you really think about it, um, we wanna make the right decision on that. The, go the goal will be to give people the kind of experience that they've had before, but in a much shortened version and with a freshness to it. Um, you know, someone told us who we've interviewed about how to do this, 45 minutes. <laughs> And I think that's very interesting. The other thing I've been very interested to learn with my team is pricing and just to sort of rethink all of that. Um, look at into attendance, look at, you know, other things. But I think content will be important, some celebratory activity, um, hopefully some music, um, and, and, and then and just make meaning out of something that very, very different for us, uh, not had before. Excellent, thank you so much. I wanna steer the conversation now to budgeting and to the idea of planned giving. Uh, Jill, if you don't mind starting us off, talk to me about enticing donors who have a specific number of mind that they need to share in philanthropic donations. How can you target that? Yeah, so thanks, Demetra. Um, so my husband and I are, are chairing a planned giving campaign for the university, actually, which has followed on the heels of a capital campaign. Um, so it's a three-year campaign, which just started this past year. You know, one might think that throwing in a global health pandemic in the middle of this might not be great timing to be chairing a capital campaign. But when it comes to planned giving, it's a, it's a detailed and complex and sort of sensitive subject anyway you're asking people to consider your institution or you know in this case with the university as their you know in their estate planning and so actually as it turns out i sort of feel like this new virtual format really lends itself to um having those kind of conversations you know it's 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 almost in some ways a more intimate format because you can really um sort of reach someone um Virtually, you can also provide them all kinds of information. So we've had, um, we recently had a webinar with um, a conversation format similar to this with different experts sort of in the field and walking through some of the different giving vehicles. And um, obviously from a capital campaign perspective, you're sort of approaching, and, and a planned giving campaign in particular, you're approaching people that already support your organization, right? So people generally aren't, aren't adding you to their, uh, in their estate plan if, they, if it hasn't been an important part of their giving and philanthropic sort of plan throughout their life. So it's people that already love your institution and then it's just having those conversations with them about sort of how they can have a lasting impact. Um, you know, after they're gone. So, um, so we found it to be actually, so we had this seminar, almost a TED talk, virtual TED talk situation going through the different vehicles. We had a lot of people participate. Um, and I, I think it's a less intimidating way for people to participate in this. And we had success with it. We had people immediately afterwards within a day or two sort of having conversations with university development that they, you know, and commitment of gifts. So it was, 
it was well received. So we plan to do more of those. Excellent. That's good to know. And Marilee, I want to ask you about that idea also, but I want to thread in cause-driven giving. So why is asking for donations for a specific cause so effective? Well, you're speaking to people's passions, right? To um, their core values. And you know, our mission of eliminating racism and empowering women, and then this phrase you don't often hear in the branding, promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all, really speaks uh, uh, to our donors and um, really to the community right now. Um, there's really, you know, two horrible viruses uh, loose right now, uh, COVID and of course, racism, systemic racism, which the Federation of YWCAs across the country is dedicated to working against. And so um, we are really promoting our mission more than ever before, and it is speaking to our donors. Um, it, you know, we have uh, recently held an event called Authentic Allyship. We spoke to Jenna Arnold, who was one of the co-founders of the 2017 uh, Women's March on Washington, and Denise Hamilton, um, about how to be a, an authentic ally to colleagues and people of color in, in all of uh, the spheres of where you have influence. We have another event coming up next week with our own uh, school superintendent, Tony Jones, uh, with Antonia Thompson from the Stanford Mayor's Office, who's gonna moderate, Chanel Henry from Greens Farms, and uh, Ann Neary from Staples High School. And we're gonna look at race, culture, and curriculum in schools everywhere. This is really an important conversation that is happening. And, and so I think um, emphasizing and leaning into those causes, whether it's women's empowerment, racism, we have a preschool after school here, we have a lot of financial aid um, that our donors like to support. Um, it's about getting to their passions, elevating those conversations, keeping your donors informed about how you are making progress and moving the needle on these causes that I, I think really is so helpful with fundraising. And Marilee, just to follow up, do you find that the virtual platform has allowed more of your audience to join in because it is not a face-to-face -face conversation that they're able to just click a button and join so you're sharing to a larger audience? Absolutely. I mean, Zoom is here to stay as far as we are concerned. Um, as I mentioned, certainly in the virtual old bags, we had participation from across the country and uh, a much larger participation. And these, uh, you know, mission-related events that we're doing now on Zoom, again, excellent uh, participation. And we will also record them and keep them available so that uh, folks can tune in whenever it's convenient for them. So it, it is here to stay. We're really uh, pleased to be able to use this platform. Excellent. Well, I want to ask about corporate giving. I know that sometimes that's a sticking point. Do you think in this new environment, it might be a boost for corporations to consider joining in different ways or giving more than they have in the past? Yeah, it has. It certainly, over a number of years, has, has seen, there's always an ebb and flow, you know, from the individual side, the private foundation grants um, can really have a, a spike in certain periods. And then of course the corporate engagement I, on, on the side of actual grants. Um, there's various different ways that obviously the corporations can engage with, with us. Um, I think when you look at the statistics though for uh, recent studies like the advisory board, it's really interesting. Um, Seven billion in grants during COVID. This is as of um, 623. Uh, 4.3 billion of, the, of from of that from business, um, and and a 36 in, percent increase in donor advised fund gifts. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this. We saw such a groundswell of new donors throughout the the early weeks, and, and really let's just say 13, 14 weeks from all different directions. Many of them actually then, of course, associating with companies and uh, an increasing number of those talking to us about designations of um, you know, opportunities where the corporate giving could match up with their individual giving. 
um, some shifts and in even including the hospital in some of the, uh, the formal materials at those companies. So I think one of the important things to look at, at least on our local level, is you know, who are all of these people who have come forward to us? Um, who do they, and what do they attach to? Um, and make things meaningful for them in terms of connecting, in our case, obviously, to the hospital, to the work of the hospital, um, and to its future growth. Um, I, you know, as, as far as the, the, the days of corporate grants and, and substantial flow of dollars from corporations, I think there remain some challenges in that area, but certainly sponsorships, uh, you know, listening um, to you, Mary Lee, and about the, the, the platform and areas of emphasis and their relevancy. If you study where the dollars are being repurposed um, by the by foundations and corporate foundations, it's these major issues of our times globally. And I think that there's real opportunity in that to get back at studying this um, and, and trying to expand that. Because again, as I said at the beginning, there is an ebb and flow, but the key to all of this is keeping your eye on the ball as to where things are developing and where guidelines are showing that actually there may be opportunity for us. I was. I was watching something recently about communities in South Carolina and hospital systems there and the remediation that they are doing, the steps that they are taking to meet the needs of those lower income families in the community who have been some of the sickest, but to start doing the things for them that actually will help to make them stronger and better if there's another surge, better meaning more ready and more able to be um, less vulnerable, let's say, um, I think you have to then back into, and where is the company money and the private foundation money for that matter that will help support that? And I suspect if you study it, I used to do institutional giving for a huge portion of my career um, simultaneously with major gifts. Um, I hunger actually for that work because it always follows the path of the greatest need in the United States and the world. And I think the companies do as well, but you have to do the work to understand it and stay abreast of it. So I will say this, we have at the hospital um, are, are just beginning to really dapple into this area again to restudy. Um, but the whole pandemic period has actually created a very interesting opportunity. And I've given my team a call to action from the first week of March when everybody roughly was starting to go home, which was, find the opportunities to learn, let me know what they are, and I will support every last one of you to spend as much time as you need to learn and bring it back to the rest of us. And so it's been an amazing journey of studying the field and the national field. And it's been, it's been I think, very, very valuable for the whole crew. So anyway, <laughs> big answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, big answer. I was um, listening to a talk with the director of the Ford Foundation the other day. Fantastic, very incredible man. I, oh, he, I'd love to have him join our panel. Um, but he was saying how there's a big call to action by the Ford Foundation and some of the largest foundations to get more corporations involved at this time. He said, you know, with the stock market doing as well as it is, the corporations should be pitching in locally and globally. So, um, so there's, you know, there's opportunity for sure. You know, can I just add one more thought here? And that that's really well stated. A, a learning that we had through COVID was that there was an immediate need at the hospital for operations and capital. And that's where we started our fundraising. But we started to listen to the leadership, Diane Kelly, Norman Roth, others, to understand what did those frontline people need? Because let's face it, they, they were really in us an experience like nothing else for an, an enormous amount of time that had a personal toll on all these people significantly. And we crafted proposals during that period that started to speak to what we were hearing. So for instance, a, a, a very special COVID specific unit with special pepper suits that we're gonna kind of take the care and the protection and in infectious disease to a whole new level. That was one proposal. Another was around disaster relief. And the fact that after 9-11, the tax codes were changed and there's actually dollars out there to fund frontline people who have had tremendous losses during a time like this. And then the third one, interestingly enough, and it grew out of interest and 
knowledge from the field at the hospital as well as our donors was around the education of the front line coming through and out of this on the premise that they will have learned so much personally and professionally that the way they think about their educations going forward will be very different. And it's, it's been amazing because those items, those three proposals um, were a very different pitch, if you will. And honestly, we never got to the corporations because we were quite blessed with some individual gifts, but I think those would have sold. So again, my point is it's about our message, our, what we're communicating and what we think we can solve in our organization. Thank you so much, and that really answers. Mary Lee, I want to give you the opportunity. Uh, one of the questions that we got was, what is the best way to reframe the opportunities now in fundraising? And it sounds like what you said, Noel, is to reintroduce yourself, to relearn, to sort of give a new perspective for the organization. Mary Lee, what do you think is the opportunity that you can take at this point? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really the same concept, um, and I, I can give you an example here. Uh, so we are launching a Center for Equity and Justice here, and, and what that does is to really bring together under an umbrella and elevate some efforts we've been making for some time here in the community around um, uh, equity, uh, in particular racial equity, uh, as well as women's empowerment. And so that's going to encompass really four pillars uh, of work, systems change, uh, policy advocacy as, as is allowed by law for nonprofits, um, community events and building awareness, and then direct programming. We're gonna be uh, uh, delivering our dive curriculum, diversity, inclusion, values, and equity uh, more broadly into the community. And so uh, while we have been doing work uh, in many ways in this area, it's a reframing and relaunching of it through this center. Uh, and we're actually looking right now for a new director of women's empowerment and racial justice. And we are finding, as we talk to donors about this right now, that this is um, very attractive and top of mind for many of them. And they're really pleased to hear how we've constructed uh, this center and this set of work. Um, I think it really speaks to how many of them would like to see progress. We also, I should mention uh, here, try to um, promote the use of RBA, results-based accounting, uh, which uh, in the nonprofit world, many you know, know that is a, a rubric or a system of measurement to um, uh, evaluate outcomes and progress. And uh, many foundations, uh, particularly Fairfield County Community Foundation here in, in this region, uh, require it of, uh, of organizations uh, where they are giving grants. And again, that is helpful to, to donors to really understand the impact you're making and the progress that's going on. Thank you so much. Jill, I wanna ask you also about the opportunity to reach a wider audience going forward. And in the context of reframing what an organization does, tell me about how board members can do some of the work of perhaps sharing a new side of an organization or sharing the message even further than they have in the past. What is your experience and what has that taught you about what you can do going forward? Um, it's a great question. Um, absolutely, and I think Mary Leah touched on this too with their response to their old bags lunch and um, the, the beauty of a virtual event is that, so say for example, our Red Cross luncheon, which normally has 200 women, but those 200 women have to, first of all, be in the New York area, have the ability to sort of either come into the city or already be in the city, dedicate a couple of hours just sitting at a luncheon. Um, you know, it, it's very, um, you know, there are physical limitations to live, you know, in-person events, whereas we were able to send this out to a a broad audience with the Red Cross. We had people in Europe dialing in, we had people on the West Coast. I sent it to my network of friends. We had people in Palm Beach, we had people in Maine. We had, you know, it was, um, so I think from that perspective, you can really reach a large audience. And a lot of people I think didn't realize sort of the blood shortages that were happening with the Red Cross. And they didn't realize all of the COVID response work that the Red Cross was doing and the convalescent plasma. and. I think by the same token, you know, for example, the 
the BCA event, um, yeah, I think every nonprofit I'm involved in now that I think about it is really reaching a larger audience at this point. So the the BCA luncheon this fall, again, you know, a thousand women, while they won't be there in person, you know, we may have 5,000 women around the globe sort of tuning into this because we can send it out to our network of friends and anyone that we know that's been impacted by breast cancer. And um, I think, you know, that is such a great event anyway, and such a, you know, important event to be able to highlight sort of survivors of breast cancer and, and the impact that the BCA has had with, um, you know, research and our fellows and our, and the various grants that we, um, that we give and the research that we're supporting that what a wonderful way to sort of spread that message, um, you know, to such a broader audience. So I think, um, I think this platform, I agree, it's here to stay. And I think it's, it really does provide, you know, looking at the glass half full, while it's sad that we can't be there in person, it's wonderful that we can reach a larger audience. And yes, the Breast Cancer Alliance event, you know, it's great to see the fashion show and be there in person and have that fun aspect of it. But we're able to do that virtually too. Like for example, this October, the event will be Carolina Herrera herself sort of being in their workrooms and showing the new collection of that. You know, you can really have fantastic programming and yet still get out your important message to, to a large group. So, and you know, I, I also am on the board of the National Theater, the Royal National Theater in London, and there's a, New York board and a London board. And that's been amazing to be able to sort of, again, sort of connect all of those folks without requiring a flight to London or, you know, an in-person sort of event, but being able to all come together, you know, in one of these virtual events, it's been, it's really actually been a good thing, I think. Well, in talking about reaching a larger audience, I have to ask about social media even if it was a smaller portion of the way you reach your audiences, I imagine there are new opportunities. Mary Lee, do you have any uh, strategies for using social media? Do you find yourself thinking about it if you weren't doing it in the past? What are the opportunities you see? I think there's great opportunity there. Uh, you know, we were certainly uh, very active on social media uh, before you know, uh, COVID. But that has certainly uh, elevated, particularly the, the live dimension of some of those platforms, whether it's Facebook Live or Instagram Live. Um, and the other um, expansion that we've undertaken is really to have several handles. Um, so, you know, we have a YWCA uh, wide handle, but then our domestic abuse services area has a handle. Uh, our baseball team has a handle. Uh, as Elaine knows, the, the, the Dolphins uh, swim team uh, has their, yes, has, um, is very active on Twitter in particular. They're the most active of all of our handles on Twitter, uh, thanks to Coach Cavataro. And so, uh, and then of course, each of us leveraging uh, each, you know, each other's posts on all of those handles, um, I think has really expanded uh, our reach and our impact there. Do you think you're reaching a different demographic of your audience? Uh, do you think perhaps, are they younger, or are they older, are they more active on social younger. media? Is it sort of a tapping into a, a level of your membership that wasn't as active before? I think so. Uh, I, I think we're moving younger and we have to be there. Uh, you know, that, you know, so many of us are there. And so, you know, everything we do, even down to registering for classes here, we have to be able to do it here uh, and connect with everyone and, and uh, provide content there. And so, yes, younger and moving everything there is so important. Noelle, I'm gonna ask you the same. What are the opportunities that you're going to be taking advantage of in the future more because of the opportunity to just go virtual with everything? Are people paying more attention you are finding to the social media handles and platforms of the hospital than they were before? I think so, and I, but I think our um, effort in it, um, Fern and Julie have been, uh, it's really been an, an enhanced pathway of activity. It had been, but I think we had a greater opportunity with, with this whole um, 
COVID and the, and the, the matters going on at the hospital. Because as I started by saying, people have, have really constantly been reaching out to us for answers to questions, to information that they needed. I think we were able to do a really nice job of linking up the resources that came online really very early in the pandemic um, from Yale New Haven and the whole health system, which of course Greenwich Hospital is a part of with five other, you know, five hospitals. Um, and driving that out to the communities that we have always worked with and then having that extend out even further. So that was one very important arm of what happened and what we've continued to nurture, frankly, because you know it has not like there's a, a hard stop here. People are interested. The, the questions are really nonstop weekly on a variety of different topics. I'm sure they're on all of your minds. I know they're on my own mind personally, so it's not surprising. And I think being able to connect and use our kind of pathway out through social media as a way to push out things from Yale, from other sources. And then the other thing that's been amazing, and, and I think again about community building um, across different age brackets, um, is, has been the conversations because when news about something special that has happened at the hospital or somebody has done for us has been pushed out, it's been, unbelievable to see the conversation so quickly back and forth in gratitude. And that word gratitude and, and just in general, that whole sense of community and that hunger for it, uh, it's been beautiful to then take some of that and put it together and share it in stewardship with the actual, let's say donors in the case of some kind of a special uh, investment that somebody has made because it ignites them even further. You know, it just sort of makes them feel such a sense of connectivity to our community. And, and, and has turned this into something that I think we just have a great opportunity to continue to amplify going forward. And, I, and we will, most certainly. That's such an interesting idea. Oh, go ahead. Was I interrupting someone? I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask about this idea, Jill, of social media as a testimonial. When you talk to other board members, do you find as though sharing the testimonials and giving them the challenge of sharing what you're doing has sort of raised the bar for giving and for giving responsibility to board members to share more of what you're doing in this time? Yeah, I think, um, and the Red Cross has done a great job with that, uh, with social media, anytime you know, whether it's sort of the larger volunteer force, um, you know, so the Red Cross in New York has partnered with um, the Leon Black Foundation and their um, giving of meals. I don't know if you've seen this, but giving of meals to hospital workers as they come off their shifts. And um, so the Red Cross folks, for example, have been manning those stations. But, you know, when I say Red Cross folks, it's all the volunteers, it's also staff members, it's also board members that go and do this. And they do a great job um, in terms of sort of always posting those stories, because to your point, Noel, you know, when you can sort of have people feel a little more sort of engaged with their philanthropy or seeing what fellow board members are doing, what fellow volunteers are doing, and being able to see the impact of your giving, it's so important. And I do think it inspires other people to give or to volunteer more of their time and or at least just to feel good about your donations, that it's really, you, you see the tangible, um, ex, you know, event of what people, it's the stories of what people are doing and the impact they're having. And so um, I think it's so important, absolutely. Let me switch now to the idea of grant writing. Mary Lee, tell me about how grant writing has changed and are you, are you using a different strategy when it comes to writing the grants, hoping to get the funds that you need to continue your mission? Great question. Um, you know, grant writing is, um, is particularly important right now. There are so many new COVID funds available uh, and we have to be able to uh, really illustrate uh, the impact that the virus had uh, on our operations. That's not a story we've had to tell before. The story of shutting down lines of, basically six lines of business in the physical sense and going remote. And so um, it's really about uh, a, a detailed explanation of what happened, how we pivoted, and how we still 
provided service uh, throughout that period. Um, and, uh, and it's a lot of grant writing. I'll say the volume of it right now is quite high. Um, we have fortunately through the YWCA system, those opportunities through foundations, both uh, community foundations and private foundations, whether they have broad uh, purposes or those um, that are dedicated to early childhood uh, uh, programs like we have or domestic violence programs, they are all really uh, being very helpful in terms of in invitations to, to grants. Now, the, the other interesting thing we are seeing is um, something that's most helpful right now, particularly for hospitals, nonprofits that are have to be on the front lines providing service, right? That has to be their, their priority is to simplify the process. Um, and so while we have to provide a detailed explanation, we are seeing um, simplification in reporting back out, uh, which are usually required with grants um, and some of the other details uh, that they may have asked previously. And then we've also seen foundations say, you know what, just use it for operating. We know you. We're normally dedicated to X that you, one of your business lines, but this time just use it for operating. We know you and we, we trust that it's going to be deployed in, a, in a, uh, an impactful way. That trust, that must be such a big statement about who you are. Yeah. Noelle, I wanna ask you the same question because tapping into this grant money that is available is gonna be a really important piece going forward. Tell us about your strategy. Yeah, so I, I, I'll give that to you and then I'll sort of try to expand this out a little bit because I think um, the, the telling of the story um, of this moment and of the needs of this moment, both from the standpoint of the institution and sort of the progress forward, if you will, because I think in every instance, if you look at guidelines for grants in particular, I mean, they're looking for that future vision, that next step. I mean, the, the fact that they also understand that, that operations are so critically important and the pendulum, once again, that pendulum has swung significantly because it used to be, you know, you really had a hard time getting the operational dollars. So that's a marvelous, like, you know, shift that there's that appreciation. Um, the writing of our purpose and our vision for the, in our case, for the hospital, is, is probably the thing we spend the, some of the uh, most significant time at. But the beauty of it is that um, there really is a, um, a vision for the hospital's future that's really been in existence in a very crystal clear way for the past two and a half years around our clinical growth plan. And it's showing um, expansion and growth for this hospital and our footprint of services in lower um, Connecticut in neuroscience, pediatrics, oncology, and heart and vascular. Much has been done and much more has to be done. So we are always thinking through that lens as we look at the writing for proposals to our donors, because interestingly enough, our individual donors are ignited by the well done proposal. And maybe I come out of that school a little bit because of the grant side and, and sort of the way they make you think so clearly when you're writing a grant. But, but the beauty is that both individuals, um, the grants that you might do to a private foundation and, and possibly a much more distilled version of it to the corporation, um, the fundamentals of what's in that has to be the same. Uh, what, what I think has been interesting is the fact that we've been encouraged and we've seen value in staying the course on all of the things we were doing in February. <laughs> in other words, there was an entire body of momentum of our operation and I'm sure each of our shops. Um, and so the, the thing that has been exciting has been to keep that pathway going and that people are asking us to do that. People on the outside are asking us to do that as well as to be making the case for that immediate need for COVID. So anyway, back to the grant writing and it's writing in general from my perspective. Um, and then it feeds into each of the different areas where you may be making a submission. I wanna ask at this time, if anyone listening has any last questions that they would like to share, please do put them in the chat box. And I wanna just give each of you the opportunity to sort of give a closing statement. Is there something that you can share 
from the bottom of your heart to really encourage those who are listening to continue their mission. It's obviously a difficult time and there's so much distraction, but keeping connected to that core mission, I'm sure is really important. Uh, first, Jill, if you could start us off. Sure. Well, you know, I would say exactly for all the fundraisers and, you know, fellow philanthropists on this call, I, I just wouldn't be discouraged because I think that, um, I, you know, I like to see it as sort of an opportunity, this new normal that we're in. And I think in many ways, you know, you can, as we've said, just sort of, you know, recapping what we've already said, but there are so many ways to reach more people and to really, in a more intimate way, sort of provide your message. And I think in some ways, I mean, we've all been on these Zoom calls um, endlessly for the last five months, but um, in some ways it forces you to be more engaged with the conversation because you're there on the screen, you're staring at yourself the entire time. So I just, um, I, I wouldn't be discouraged. I would, I would stay the course and people want as, you know, particularly given that this audience is sort of the, the Greenwich and the New York area, you know, it's a lot of smart people that really um, want to feel engaged with their philanthropy and to have good information as to um, where those dollars are going. So people appreciate it and they want it. So I would stay the course. Excellent encouragement. I'm sure they appreciate that very much. Mary Lee, give us your thoughts, please. Or really, really two points. Um, and the first goes back to the point of, of telling that story of need right now. Uh, you know, whether it's the, the spike in, in domestic violence while, you know, victims are quarantining with abusers or the rising need in financial aid that we're, we're already seeing for our preschool and after school programs. Um, you have to be able to clearly tell that story of me that's emerged uh, in the last five months uh, to your donors. And that story is there um, for the telling. The second is to focus on that stewardship. Don't lose that. Uh, critically important uh, function of staying in touch with your donors, sending them articles, you know, Zooming with them, emailing, picking up the phone, uh, and uh, making sure those relationships are fresh and, uh, and engaged uh, during a, a time when everybody's really uh, staying distant. Noelle, your final thoughts. Thank you. Well, I'm building on my colleagues, which all of those points so beautifully stated. I mean, I think there are three things. Um, just be proud and build on your mission. Um, we are all working in areas that are so important and um, just continually refresh and relook at it and celebrate it and make sure, you know, it's the thing that is motivating you every single day. Um, it always did and it should all the more so today. Um, and I think we should all be thrilled and excited about being able to do that and represent our organizations. Um, I think I want to suggest, per remember to personalize. I think there's a lot of push to hit abroad and it's good, big audiences, <laughs> many people. But one of the things we've learned is, you know, look at the list. I mean, who needs a call? and just be in touch, you know, get in touch with people. Sometimes even a 10 minute phone call that says, I was thinking about you. I have some interesting information. I thought you would find it wonderful. Wherever those people are, I, I think we have to just remember to do that all the time. And then the last thing I would say is creativity, <laughs> creativity and creativity. Look around, there's a lot of amazing examples that so many people are deploying. It may not be perfect for your organization, but I, I just think there's an opportunity to utilize that creativity and, and, and make the most of this moment. Um, we're gonna bridge forward, there's no question. We are bridging forward. Um, and opportunities like this to partner with all of you. Just thank you so much. Noella Pell, Marilee Kiernan, and Jill Coyle, we are incredibly grateful for your time all of your ideas. We know that truly everyone listening is able to walk away today with such tangible steps to take. And for that, we are so thankful. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.